All right, fine. I'll admit it. We're a little behind in answering your letters. <laughs> We're a few weeks behind. We've been getting so many letters, and I love reading them all, but our policy is to answer every letter we get. So uh, because the volume has increased uh, and our pace has continued to be the same, uh, we, are, we are definitely behind. But we will soldier on and, uh, and continue to answer every letter and to uh, begin every show with our favorite letter of the week. Today's you'll recognize as being rather current. So we're, maybe we're catching up. I don't know. Uh, but this is our favorite one of the week, and, uh, and you'll definitely see it's rather topical. It's from Anthony from New Jersey, and he writes the following. Dear Alex, love the podcast and wanted to say thank you for introducing me to all these cool new artists. I listened to your show on the drive home from work, and I want to say you are truly excellent company. Oh, Anthony, thank you. That's a very, very nice thing to say. Uh, he goes on to write, anyway, you seem like a wise guy. So I thought I'd see if you could answer my question. Because of the coronavirus, Alex, everyone's been buying hand sanitizer, and now there is none left in the stores. So people have started making their own at home with rubbing alcohol, aloe vera, and tea tree oil, which is cool. But now those ingredients are all gone. So I've had to improvise with what's left on the shelves. Last night, I made my own hand sanitizer with a box of mint Tic Tacs, hydrogen peroxide, crumpled up Oreos, and a Snapple iced tea. What do you think that will get me? Uh, well, Anthony, <laughs> I think if you wash your hands with your hand sanitizer you've created at home, uh, that will get you coronavirus. That's my unprofessional <laughs> uh, medical opinion. I think you're, uh, you're setting yourself up there, pal. I would search out one of those $200 bottles of Purell. <laughs> I try to, I try to find those. Your, uh, your concoction uh, sounds like a disaster, but I do appreciate that you like the program. All right, I'm Alex Green, and this is Stereo Embers, the podcast. Check this out. We're on the road to nowhere. Come on inside. Taking the ride to nowhere. Featuring my guest today on the program, John Dolmayan. Let me tell you a little bit about John Dolmayan. Now, if John's name sounds familiar, that's because it probably is. He's the drummer of the legendary Grammy Award-winning metal band System of a Down. Born in Lebanon to Armenian parents who relocated the family to California in the 70s, John started showing an interest in drums by the age of two. Because his sax-playing dad had an expansive record collection, he introduced him to a vast array of classic practitioners behind the kit. By the time he was a teenager, Dolmayan's taste ran from Maynard Ferguson to Neil Peart, and his own playing was a perfect blend of power and swing. He joined System of a Down in 1997, and yes, of course, the rest is history. The L.A. band has sold almost 50 million albums worldwide. They remain one of the most potent live acts on the planet. And Dolmayan is considered by many to be one of the greatest metal drummers of all time. Now, here's the thing about the guys in System of a Down. They stay busy. <laughs> Though still very much together, the band isn't an ongoing proposition, so staying busy is the way to go. Over the years, Dolmayan has formed the band's Indicator and Scars on Broadway. He started Torpedo Comics, and now, after all these years in the business, he's launched his first solo project called These Gray Men. 
a covers album that features System of a Down singer Surge, Rage Against the Machine's Tom Morello, and Avenged Sevenfold's M. Shadows. The album features takes on numbers by The Talking Heads, David Bowie, and Radiohead. The album itself was conceived by Dolmayan on long drives while listening to satellite radio. Eclectic, innovative, and filled with dark grooves, These Gray Men is a refreshing and thunderous piece of work. Dolmayan plays with muscle and fire, and his jackhammer beats are accompanied by thoughtful and melodic fills that have both power and finesse. Okay, so there's that. Now, let me tell you about our chat. Now, maybe some of you out there have a friend who is brutally honest. Like, honesty is, is their thing. You always know where they stand, and maybe that can be a little bit painful sometimes, but you know they have your best interests at heart, and they don't have the energy or the interest in saying whatever it is that's going to make you happy. They are no sycophant. They are there to tell you the truth because they care about you. And the truth, well, we all know it can hurt sometimes. But in the end, we respect them more than anybody else because they were the only ones who were willing to tell us how it really is. So John Delmayan is like that friend. He's that guy. Sure, he's brutally honest. But the thing is, you always know where he stands. And the fact is, John is a really nice guy. I enjoyed this conversation very much. To be honest, at first I thought that he was uh, in a terrible mood. He didn't want to really do the podcast, and he was just doing it to be nice. But that wasn't really true. He had just come back from some kind of comic book thing, and he told me he was tired. He probably had been doing interviews all day. He was probably sick of talking about things, but you know what? He talked about things with me, and it was awesome. In the end, it got a little political. It surprised me. It took a weird turn. It just got super political out of nowhere. That was what was so surprising. And, uh, you know, just because my views are not the same as John Dolmayan's views, who cares? He's a really nice guy. And, you know, we're adults. I don't need everyone to agree with me. If I did, I wouldn't be an adult. I'd be a big, stupid baby. <laughs> Which I'm not. I like when people have different opinions than me because I learn stuff. It's interesting. And this conversation is exactly that. So sit back and enjoy this chat with me and John Dolmayan right here on Stereo Embers, the podcast. I recorded about 15 songs. And um, I had earmarked certain songs for certain vocalists. Some of them couldn't make it or some of them didn't want to do the project. So rather than just go to somebody else and say, hey, sing this song, I decided not to include them in this uh, release, which doesn't necessarily mean they won't be released at a later time. And then I just tried to make the best uh, flow, you know, from song to song as possible for the songs that I did release. When you chose certain songs like say like road to nowhere or bowie track do you remember hearing those songs for the first time when you were when you were a kid uh you know i don't remember how i heard them first time usually when you were a kid back then people would just turn you on to stuff i guess right. that's still the case here i just feel like the discovery process is a lot easier these days than it was back then because you literally had to know somebody that had the tape or had the record you know, um, or go buy it, right? Like now, it's like, oh, check out this band. In two seconds, you're on either a streaming service or YouTube and you're checking it out, you know, um, so it's much more accessible now. But back then it was like, hey, this friend introduced me to Bowie, another friend introduced me to The Who, another friend introduced me to Fishbone, you know, and you kind of introduced them to some, the music that you were into and so on and so forth. And there were certain friends that they, they they never let you down. They were always taping you the coolest stuff. Yeah, you know, I have one friend, Louis, who I've known since I was like 14. And he introduced me to pretty much all like the 60s and 70s rock stuff. Um, so he was a massive Stones fan. Who, uh, Beatles, Zeppelin. You know, he introduced me to almost all of that stuff. And then... Of course, my father being a musician, I had his records to enjoy, and he was a big jazz guy, so I got introduced to Stan Getz, Maynard Ferguson, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, 
the you know, list goes on and on. He had a couple right. hundred records. And and um you know, when when I finally got a drum set I started playing to whatever music was on the radio. So I used to listen to the radio and, and just play along with it. Or my dad's records or records that I had or friends had. Or sometimes we'd you know, they'd make tapes for me and we did stuff like that. And so the introduction to the music was different, but in some ways the same. I still have my old Maxell XL two S's that people made for I don't have the heart to get rid of them. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a part of your history. I understand that. Yeah. But but your kids one day after you're gone, they'll they'll probably just throw those away. And they're inanimate objects and, and they really just they represent memories and times of your life, you know. Yeah, I, I used to carry those Are things they, around with me like you know, like they were they were the secret to the to the world. Well they were. You know, they were the secret to your world, to your imagination, to your expression. So in a lot of ways, they were the secret to the world. As a drummer, when you hear a song, because I'm a writer, so I hear lyrics always emerge to me first. Um, mm-hmm. As a drummer, do you, what do you hear first? I always wonder about that. For me, it's the melody. That's my. That's really the focus when I'm listening to music. Structure and melody. Um, structure came later. In the early days, it was all melody. With the exception of a few albums, I almost know no lyrics to any any songs that are out there, including System. You know, it's kind of laughable how little I know of the lyrics of my band and other bands. When I'm coming up with drum parts, I'm not listening to the lyrics. I'm listening to the syncopation, where the lyrics fall, where the melody is, how it flows, and how I can how I can expand on it and work around it. Um, more like a, a cello or a violin playing together than anything else. You know, like when when they play together well, and then when they work together well, it could be quite beautiful. And when they don't, it could be irritating. So, and Rick taught us a lot of that. You know, Rick was really good at uh, kind of I don't want to say dumbing down, but kind of mellowing out some of the drumming. I I, I would be doing a lot more on the albums if. Uh, if not for Rick, in a good way and a bad way. What you're saying is that that like with Rick, he he taught you then to sort of like economize. Is that what you're you were getting at? Well, he kind of uh, forced me to. You know, um, I was a little more exuberant back then, especially when I was like 25. Um, there there are things that I don't like about Rick. You know, I love Rick to death, and I think he's a fantastic producer. Um. And a, the guy's phenomenal on arrangement, but his favorite drummers are not my favorite drummers. So we differ. Uh, we differ as far as who we respect in the drum world, and his are more behind the scenes, kind of like you don't notice them very much, and more, you know, uh, in the forefront. I've learned a lot from Mick, a lot. Have you? learned over the years like what have you done with that exuberance on your own i mean in other words if you compare yourself now to you know 25 30 years ago what's changed in in the way that you play well i think for one thing i can now hear everybody on stage which is nice you know (laughs) before i couldn't hear everybody (laughs) um because the technology wasn't as great um other than that i'm more confident in arrangement I discovered uh, that I enjoy doing string instrumentation, arrangement, writing. The technology is great, so I didn't have to go through like 20 years of learning every single instrument to be able to come up with something. I did a lot of the strings on uh, on this album, and I really enjoyed that. I noticed I have a, a great love for that. Other than that, I think I learned uh, most of the things that I incorporate by like by the end of the uh, toxicity sessions, you know, um, we were really at, at our best as far as uh, we were touring a lot, so we were, you know, anticipating each other's moves very well, and and um, we were, even by like mesmerized hypnotized recording, we had still been touring enough to where we were very powerful and able to anticipate each other. But I feel like because there was so much drama involved during that process of recording those albums, we weren't at our best. You know, I think we were at our best during the 44 or so songs we recorded for Toxicity. So I incorporated everything I've learned in, in the recording of this, of this album, in this process, 
uh, it's harder doing it on your own. You know, you can't rely on um, the talent of others as much. And, you know, the, you're forced to make all the decisions. And sometimes that's positive. Sometimes that's negative. I really enjoyed having, you know, very talented people in the band that uh, that had opinions on things. Not that I didn't have that in this. It's just that from the get-go, this was my project, and people came in for parts of it, but they weren't there from beginning to end, with the exception of James Hazy. Um, you know, there's, you're stronger with four. That's just the bottom line. Did you like being the captain of the ship this time around? I don't, I don't know. Again, like, uh, it would have been better if the other three guys were in it. That's just the bottom line. So, um, I don't know of a more prolific lyricist than Serge. He's incredible. Darren is the best songwriter that I've ever worked with by far. And Shavo is an incredible songwriter in his own right, especially when it concerns, like, uh, just coming up with incredible parts. You know, Shavo is responsible for many of the best uh, musical parts in System of a Down, although uh, he doesn't quite get the credit that he deserves, in my opinion. Then again, neither do I in System of a Down. So, you know, people kind of focus on Darren and Serge, which I understand. They're extremely talented. Ultimately, you're better if you have great talent with you. And it makes your talent explode more and challenge you more. In a band, the relationship between the drummer and the bass player is is a lot more unique than I think I understood when I got into this business as a writer. Um, I didn't realize how important it was for the bass player and the drummer to be to be especially locked in. Is, is that true? Not so much in system. The guitar, the both guitars, the bass and the lead, are uh, very often doing the same thing. So same root notes. So there isn't, uh, for example, if you listen to Tool, sometimes they sound like they're playing different songs. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to isolate the bass tracks and isolate the guitar tracks, they're they're not playing together as much. And in system, that's the opposite. We we have. Uh, a lot of the same thing happening with the guitar and the bass. So I want to say that's as true in system. Of course, you always need to be locked in. But I think you need to be locked in with everybody. Darren isn't the type of guitar player that's doing a lot of uh, extended solos. You know, he has very short, tasteful solos. So a lot of it is just more rhythmic. And, um, you know, same with Serge. Serge is a very rhythmic singer. Yeah, I... I talked to Shavo, uh, who, by the way, is what exuberance really is. He's a very exuberant guy, right? I'm sure it's a very different interview that you're having with me than it was with Shavo. <laughs> but I'm, I'm exhausted, man. I was at a comic convention all weekend, so I'm very tired. Well, he, you know, he, he, I feel like Shavo never gets tired. Um, you're probably but, right. <laughs> but he was telling me that he, you know, he, his daily discipline is uh, – he, he, he plays all the time. Are you – in terms of the way that you approach your instrument and the way that you approach your, your daily routine, do you play every day? Are you a guy who practices all the time? I uh, No, not almost never. Almost never. We have shows coming up, so I'll probably start like next week. I've been avoiding it because I'm so busy doing other things, but I'll probably start playing, you know, like an hour a day or so the next two months, two and a half months until the shows. Um, but, in, in a lot of ways, I focus my energy on what I think needs to focus the most. So, for example, uh, I'm writing a comic book right now, which takes a lot of energy and focus, and um, I'm putting a lot of my efforts into that. I have businesses that I run that take a lot of time and energy, and I have a family that takes a lot of time. So I have to look at what the benefit is to the cost of time. So if I'm playing, let's say, two hours a day on drums, where is it going to go? You know, I'm playing pretty much for my own enjoyment and to keep my chops up, but I'm not playing drums enough with system or anybody else to warrant that kind of effort. So I have to focus the effort into what is actually going to be the most important for my life at that time. Now, of course, while the sh when shows are coming up, then I have to balance it out, take out effort from other things and put it into this. You know, you only have so many hours in the day. There's no anxiety on your end of if you don't play for a week, you, you don't you don't feel anxious like I should get back behind the kit. No, 
usually when I'm uh, when I'm at a show, I get that bug. You know, when I'm watching other bands. Um, but no, I don't really worry about it. I pl- I've been playing drums for 30 years. Yeah. If I, can't, if I can't take six months off from playing drums and come back. And I, I got incredible muscle memory, too. Look, I, I would definitely be a better drummer. But to what end? System's not making albums. I made one covers album. It took me four years to do it just because life gets, you know, pulls you in a million different directions. And then you have other pursuits. And also when you're working with other people, you have to do it on their timeline. So, like, let's say I focused five hours a day and I became just, like, ridiculous, which I have the potential to do. I, I do have the talent. Then what? Then I'm in a band that doesn't work. So what's the point? Nobody else has called me and said, John, we want you to play in our band because drummers are pretty smart. They don't generally get kicked out of bands. You know, so you get what I'm saying? Like, why put the effort into it? I'd rather put the effort into something else that um, that could be successful or pursue something else artistically that's more fulfilling. Yeah. That makes sense? I mean, it does. I get that too, especially at our age. I, I, I absolutely. I mean, I don't think that the seventeen-year-old version of me would have understood that, but, but the nearly fifty-year-old version of me does. Well, at seventeen, I didn't have kids. I didn't have a business. Um, I didn't have other pursuits. I had no money, so I didn't have the ability to go do anything else. You know. Um, I think pretty much all I did was maybe hang out with my friends and go to the gym and. And play drums for three or four hours a day but you know also if you think about like how much better you get as a drummer when you're first beginning you're making larger strides and uh, you know those two or three hours of effort they're showing more you know more benefits if i play for two or three hours now i don't get that much better in fact i probably don't get better if i played for two or three hours every single day yeah i would get incrementally better but it wouldn't be enough to notice, you know, like for me to be like, wow. And then again, it, it boils down to, so I do all that and I get better and I can do different things and expand on my drumming. And then what? What do I use it on? I got no outlet. Mm. Right. 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 It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. If it doesn't make sense, I just don't do it. I walk along, I wonder What went wrong with our love Love that was so strong Yes, I still walk all I think of The things we've done together While our hearts were young
say to a 15 year old who's picking up the sticks for the first time in terms of practice what would you say to that kid the more effort you put in the beginning the better you'll be as far as your your limits right like uh, everybody has limits your talent is very important because if you don't have the talent i don't care how much you practice you're probably not going to be very good um and uh listen to as many different genres of music you can incorporate as many into your rehearsals as you can be weary of lessons, you know, only because if you take lessons, you're going to learn, you know, that style from that person. And if you do take lessons, I would recommend taking them from as many different teachers as possible so that you can get a well-rounded education. But I find that the best lesson is just to play, practice, explore, exploit your abilities, and uh, really focus on playing a diverse style and range of music. And again, look, this is my path. There's no right or way wrong, wrong, right or wrong way of doing something. You know, it's just how you do it. But this is what worked for me. I'll just take albums and put them on and play them. One day I'd be playing Iron Maiden. The next day I'd be playing Stan Getz. The day after that I'd play Rush. Um, so I gravitated to the musicians that I enjoyed. <clears throat> Sometimes I'd play Armenian folk music. Or, uh, you know, you could you could just turn on the radio and play along to every song that comes on. That's a great way to learn timing. So yeah, that that was what I did. That was my path. I didn't go to like musicians institute and sit there and learn rudimentary exercises and you know, I find a lot of those guys are really good, very good technically and all that. And then you give them a song, they don't know what the fuck to do. You know, like they play like basic beats, nothing interesting, nothing innovative. You know, um, this is a, this isn't like classical music where it's very regimented and you have your notes in front of you and all that. This is, this is avant-garde. You know, you have to create something. As a drummer, you have a responsibility to create something just as interesting as the music you're playing to, or sometimes take what is, what would normally be mundane and make it interesting. It's your responsibility. Well, it sounds like when you were growing up, you had an appetite for the bombastic and the subtle. Yeah, I was very lucky. Very lucky. And keep in mind, I was also listening to 80s New Wave. You know, like, so when I was out, I was all over the place as a music fan, which really wasn't that common back then. You either kind of like one genre or another. But I'd play NWA just as much as I'd play Rush. You know, so I was all over the place. And uh, and I think that worked well because System of a Down is all over the place stylistically and and uh, definitely goes into a lot of directions and a lot of changes and and calls for a drummer to have have the ability to make a lot of changes and and uh, jump from one style to another in one song. You know, that's why it's so hard to replicate System. Now I know that this record took years to make. Um, 
when you think about recording a follow up without the democracy that you that you mentioned earlier, does that seem daunting? No, it's not daunting. And it is a it is a democratic process because I'll take anyone's opinion if it's going to improve something. You know, I just don't have that type of ego. I like working with other people. And uh, although it was my overall vision, I did take other people's opinions if it made sense. And if it didn't, we would argue the positives and negatives of it. But we would try everything. You know, um, I just feel like when you're in a band, as opposed to people kind of just working with you, you're going to get more honest opinions. You know, um, if you saw the Queen movie, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, when the singer went off and made his own album, he was like, hey, they did exactly what I said. They were the best musicians available and this, that. And, you know, I didn't have you arguing with me over the chorus and I didn't have you arguing over the beat, you know, and, and because of that, the music suffered. And that's just the bottom line. you got to have diverse opinions in the band. Just like you have to have diverse opinions in life, politics, everything. If everybody thinks the same way, you can have no growth. You can have no expansion. You know, um, you're stifled. So if people around you saying, oh, John, that was genius, uh, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, that's not going to be very helpful. I don't have people like that around me. Nobody around me. I, I get rid of people like that say that stuff to me. I want real opinions. I ask people who, who I respect who will tell me an honest opinion on something. And I, and I say, look, what's the negative? You know? Um, different people react differently to things. I just don't enjoy that. And I think it's fake. And I think that's a part of the reason why a lot of really big bands don't stay together is because they are surrounded by people that tell them how great they are all the time. And they start to believe their own bullshit. Yeah, and I, I know you got to go, but I mean, you are—you've always been good at at taking uh, you know, opposing opinions and and criticism. You've always been and good at that, I guess. Well, I'm taking a lot of flack for my opinions on Trump. I'll tell you that much. Tell me in what way. People are very close-minded, and um, young people are kind of dumb. You know, they don't have a lot of wisdom, and uh, they look at the world through the view of you know, what their experiences are, which is understandable. It's just that their experiences aren't very wide ranging. And, um, you know, they can't stand for somebody else to have an opinion that differs with the one that they have. And if, you know, if, if there's a musician or, art, you know, it's very popular right now to hate Trump and to be on the left and all that, you know, it's the easy thing to do, but I don't, I don't look at things that way. You know, 20 years ago, when I thought that conservatives were doing things I didn't agree with and they were infringing on people's rights and all that, I railed against them. And now, in my opinion, the liberals are doing what the, even worse than what the conservatives were doing. So now I uh, rail against them. I have no political party that I'm going to, or ideology that I'm going to stick with for my whole life. You know, I'm going to change my opinions. I'm going to change my thoughts and I'm going to change my allegiances based on what's best for my family, what, what I think is best for the entire country as a whole. You know, a lot of the times young people don't understand. They're like, well, you know, there's no fairness and why should you have this and I don't have this? And it's easy for artists and actors and, you know, a lot of people to be like, that's right, you know, you should have that. But these are people. They're already rich. They already have everything that they need. So what they're really saying is, I've got it. I'm not willing to give mine up. But as you grow older and you earn, you should give up yours. I have to explain to this very young, foolish person the other day on uh, Instagram. I go, I'm not, I'm not saying these things for myself. I'm saying it for you. I've already made my money. You know, like I've already made my fortune in life. I might make more. I don't know. But I'm already comfortable. You're the one that's uh, striving to get somewhere in life. And if you're taxed out of existence to pay for other people that don't want to work or or aren't as motivated as you to accomplish something, well, where's the fairness in that? You know, and like, I want you to have the equal opportunity to succeed as everybody else. And I want people that don't put in the effort to suffer the consequences. The ant and the grasshopper. 
Well, now we want to make the grasshopper the popularized version. That doesn't work. We've got too many examples of that not working. And uh, and I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want my kids growing up in that. I want people to work hard, accomplish something, have some personal pride. I want the government to stay the fuck out of our lives. It's as simple as that. And I'm willing to take all the flack in the world because it doesn't mean anything to me. Other people's opinions don't matter. You know, I'm going to... My daughters try to get away with whatever they can, but I have to give them rules. I have to explain to them that, like, there's consequences in life to their actions so that when they grow up, they realize that as well. And they grow up to be good people with good moral fiber, and they strive to better the world to the best of their ability. And you're always willing to take new information and then change your mind about someone's, you know, performance or someone's attitude. That's correct. I tell you, I really like the job Trump's doing. I don't like everything he's doing. But in general, I think the country is in a better place because of Trump. Now, if Trump goes the other way, I'll stop supporting him. It's very simple. You know, I don't care what party he's in. If he's going to lead this country, then I want him to make it as good as it can be. You know, and I would I would expect that our uh, congressional representatives and our uh, Senate the senatorial representatives work hard to help him do that and not obstruct everything he does. And it seems to be in the last like 20 years or so, it's a lot of obstruction and um, political side picking. Are we in, are we in junior high school or are we running a country? You know, I'm like uh, these assholes have to get it together. And, um, if they don't, the only people that are going to suffer are the people that have nothing. Those are the people that always suffer. You know, in 2006 to 8, there was a lot of – one of the reasons we had that whole uh, crisis, financial crisis, is because a lot of liberals said it's not fair, you know, um, that people can't get loans to buy houses and we need to open up and, and uh, open up the process. And, of course, the bankers were like, great. <laughs> we're going to borrow it from the Fed anyway. What does it matter? It's not even our right. money. You know? And you know who paid the price for it? It's the it's the people. The, the people that aren't well off and um, the people that had pensions and all that. They're the ones that got fucked. Because there's always a consequence. You know? Somebody's going to pay the price. And I guarantee you it's not going to be the people in charge. When you have communism, trust me, the communist leaders were living the high life. It was the people that were, the common people that were starving on the streets. When you have socialists, a fucking idiot in Venezuela is flying in that, that Turkish chef, you know, the salt guy, for private dinners. He's not suffering, trust me. But his people are eating out of garbage cans. You know? Capitalism may not be the greatest system. I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But at least you have an equal opportunity to be successful in the capitalist system. So if it's the best thing we got, until we find a way to improve on it, I'm going to fight hard to keep that um, to keep that process going, so that the future generations have an opportunity to succeed. Do you avoid <laughs> talk politics with with uh, with most people, or are are you happy to talk talk politics? I talk politics quite a bit with people. Most of my friends are, are uh, I'd say like 50% of my friends are liberal, maybe 60. And um, all, almost all my ar our artist friends are liberal, almost all. There's some that are not, but they they do nothing to put it out there. You know, I, I'm one of the dumb ones that actually wants to try to make something better for other people, even at risk to myself. Uh, I don't know. I think that, and I get along just fine with everybody. I get along just fine with Tom Morello and his ideas make me want to vomit, you know, but he's a nice guy and I enjoy his company. Same thing with Serge. He's my brother-in-law. When I have conversations with him about politics, we have very good civil debates, you know, and um, he's got his points and I've got mine. And I think we expand each other's perspectives, which is what you're supposed to do. You know, we don't go at each other's throats or beat each other up. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. just civil discussion. Sure. Civil because, understanding. Well, we're, we're, we're really, we're really all kind of centrist at the end of the day, anyway. 
you know, maybe he's a little more socially minded than I am. And I'm a little more um, conservative with some of my views, but at the end of the day, we're pretty close. You know, guess what? Tom Morello is a millionaire. He travels in private jets. So does Serge. You know, so do I. And we go on tour. We play in front of thousands, tens of thousands of people. And we get paid a lot of money to do it. We're not digging ditches. You know, so for me to sit here and condescend to people and uh, tell them, like, uh, this is what you have to do and give up this and do that when I've got so much, not right. No, I want everybody to have the opportunity to have what I have. You know, I don't want to take that away from future generations because I got it. I want them to have it as well. But I don't want the fucking person that's going to make bad choices their whole life and be lazy to then, you know, eat off the fruit of the person that grew the tree. That's what I don't want to see. Make sense? Makes sense. Are there moments with Surge where he'll make a point and you'll go, oh, that's actually a pretty good point? Yeah, of course. He's an intelligent guy. And he's a very caring person, you know? Um, and I think he does the same with me. He may not want to admit it, you know, but he just, he's, he's, he's better spoken than I am. He's better educated than I am. So when he goes on Instagram, the way he even words things, the way he even words things is better than the way I do it. I'm more to the point, you know? And um, so, and I'm also on the, more on the right and I support Trump. So I get hammered, hammered. You know, but I get a lot of private messages because there's a lot of kids out there that think the way I think, but they get destroyed if they say it in public, you know? And I think that's wrong. They, you know, having a different opinion doesn't make you a bad person. You know, um, I think the bad people are the one that make you feel bad about having a different opinion. Those are the bad people, in my opinion. You know, I've always operated under the idea that just because the opinion that you have is unpopular, it, it shouldn't change the opinion that you have. No. It takes real balls to put it out there. Go read my Instagram fucking comments, bro. Go read them. I put one up about Bernie, who I think is a is an enemy of the state. And uh, you should see how I, I got hammered. You should get kicked out of the band. Meanwhile, I own 25% of the band. Good luck kicking me out. You, know, <laughs> you should, uh, you know, you're, you're a disgrace. Don't you listen to lyrics system? You know, well, yeah, I listen to lyrics system. I don't really, I don't really know them. <laughs> and, uh, and even if I did, what does that matter? That's Serge's lyrics. Those are Serge's lyrics in general. I didn't write those lyrics. Those, don't, those never represented who, my thinking, you know? I just happened to play drums. If I wrote the lyrics, maybe it'd be a different audience we'd be playing to. You know, we had a lot of problems in the system because, you know, there were times when Serge would say things that we didn't agree with. But I didn't agree with it. But, you know, we didn't want to stifle his artistry. So, you know, it is what, again, when you're playing to young people, they're going to have more of a liberal mindset. And that's understandable. Because at the end of the day, they're kind of naive about life, you know. As they get older, they'll understand things more and they'll understand why things are happening and how bad there's the repercussions are for somebody that makes bad decisions and, you know, that life is finite. You have to take advantage of the opportunities that you have, you know, because there's not many of them in life. When it comes to the medium of social media, there's a great example of, you know, I, I think it's important not to listen to comments of praise or comments of criticism. You shouldn't listen to either one of them. You never should. You never should because unless it's somebody that, that you know intimately, it's kind of meaningless. You know, um, there's people that tell me this album is the best album they've ever heard. And if that's the case for them, then that's great. That's their experience. That doesn't change what I do. You know, and there's people that say it sucks. Should I curl up in a ball because somebody said it sucks? And then wait for a comment if somebody said they loved it to change my mood? No. I'm just going to continue living my life. I put it out there. You know, it, it, it's a lot of work. I take a lot of pride in it. If people enjoy it, great. If they don't, I really don't give a shit. I don't do it for them. I do it for me. Well, John, keep doing it. And I appreciate your time, buddy. I know you're tired. And th thanks for chatting. 
Well, the only reason I have to get off is because I have another interview about like eight minutes ago. Oh, shit. Okay. All right. <laughs> Buddy, thanks a lot. All right, bro. Thanks. You know, I left that last part in there because I wanted you guys to hear that he would have kept chatting with me. He was tired and he would have kept talking uh, had he not had another interview lined up. So uh, I appreciate that. Nice guy. I appreciate his honesty. Uh, I found him to be very, very genial. I I like John. Good guy. And uh, that record, These Gray Men, go get it. It's ferocious. Really strong work. But what, you know, what would you expect from John from System of a Down? Shoddy work? No, not that guy. He, uh, he plays with muscle, he plays with power, and uh, he plays with grace. And he doesn't do anything, uh, you know, halfway. It's 100%. So it's a very satisfying listen. Go buy it. All right, go to my website, alexgreenonline.com. Find out what's going on with me. I had some cool stuff lined up, and uh, it's now been canceled. The coronavirus has hijacked my exciting news. That's, uh, that's what I get for talking about it so much. But I'm glad I didn't tell you what it is. Uh, I know I've been, I've been referencing it a lot, and I was going to, uh, you know, I was going to bring it all out the first week of April. But, uh, but alas, no. So, you know, you'll never know. I'm glad, though, because if I had told you what it was and then, I, I, you know, I had to tell you that it wasn't going to happen, we'd all be sad. So this way, I'm the only one who's sad. <laughs> OK, I'm protecting you. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> all right. Follow me on Twitter at Ember's Editor. I'll try to protect you there, too. Uh, also, Instagram at Embers Podcast. You can also email me, editor, at StereoEmbersMagazine.com. Stereo Embers, the podcast, is available on all podcast platforms. So go to the one that you use, subscribe, uh, you know, leave a nice comment for us, and tell a friend. Those are only three things I'm asking of you. Uh, four would be pushing it. Three, I think it's tasteful. Thank you, as always, for listening to Stereo Embers, the podcast. Let's do one more song from John's album. This is Hung Up. Enjoy it, and I'll see you next time right here on Stereo Embers, the podcast, only on Bombshell Radio. This place has never been the same. A consequence of fame. Sometimes I wish I never felt the pain.
so far away, so far away. Why don't you come dance with me? Watching me, watching you, watching me, watching me, watching you, watching me, watching me, watching you.